1973, Johnny Carson told a joke that rocked the world. He said, you can laugh now, but there's an acute shortage of toilet paper. Now there wasn't, but nobody knew that, and it didn't matter. Millions started hoarding. And it took the United States four months to solve the problem, all because of a joke on a show. So we've been through this before. You name a church series, Stranger Things, and you have kind of one idea for what this series is going to mean months in advance, but you don't realize how relevant it's going to be. Both that we need to talk about evil, we need to talk about the brokenness of this creation, and that there's just strange things going on out there. One funny thing about toilet paper, bidets may finally make their way to the United States. In fact, sales have skyrocketed. I checked in this past week, and at first sales had gone up two times and then three times, and now they're up 10 times. So if you're one of those people that invested in bidet stock about a year ago, go ahead and raise your hand. Your family should congratulate you. You're a rich man now. That would be amazing. Now, I don't know what bidets have to do with church, but what are you going to do? Nobody's here. Nobody can kick me out. So don't worry. Nobody's watching. Um, And here we go. So like most of you, it's been strange for me to work from home this week and to work with my kids. And so my kids and I in our free time decided to start watching again the first series of the show Stranger Things. I wanted to refresh myself on why 40 million people binge watch this show and why it's so popular. And part of me, I I know it's because we have nostalgia about the neon-wearing 80s that we grew up in. But for those younger or for those that don't really remember that time, why is it that it's so popular? And I think it's not just nostalgia. I think it's because we sense that there's more going on out there that there's more going on, the wor- going on out in the world. Like when you walk into a house, and you don't know what it is, but you feel goosebumps just standing up on the back of your neck. Or when you sense you have a need to call someone, and then you do, and it's like you knew the whole time, not necessarily like in your thoughts, but you knew the whole time that you needed to reach out to them. Or when you meet somebody for the first time, And you just know things are not right. There's more going on underneath the surface. There's more going on than just what we can touch, what we can smell, what we can feel, what we can see. It's like we're acknowledging the supernatural is real. And and, in fact, despite all the reality that we can sense, maybe the supernatural is just as real as everything else. That's why we binge watch Stranger Things. When I was a kid, the horror movie I wasn't supposed to watch was The Exorcist. Now, of course I did. I just didn't let my parents know that I was watching it. And this 1973 movie was the story of a little girl who becomes demon-possessed. But it was not until I was studying to be a pastor that I found out the story was based on a, a true story that happened. It was about a little boy who was 14 in Maryland. In fact, he was a Lutheran. And this little boy became, he got to such a point that his parents took them to their their local pastor, but the local pastor wasn't sure what to do. And so they ended up bringing the boy to St. Louis, to the seminary where I studied, so that the professors there could help exorcise the demon. That's how bad things were. And the professors started to realize this was, more than they could, they could control. This is, this is more than they could deal with. And they finally turned the boy over to the Jesuit Christians nearby. This is all back in 1945, 1949. And after several attempts, the Jesuits were able to help the boy. He was finally healed, and eventually he became a father and a grandfather and lived a normal life. And you can read accounts about this in newspapers from all over our country. And there's some conflicting accounts, but I think there's a part of us that just wonders, maybe there's more going on out there. In fact, I even had a friend who wrote a book about this, and so that's where I learned a lot of of this story for myself. Uh, I had the chance recently to meet the author Shane Wood, who's an academic dean at Ozark Christian College. 
And he tells the story of his friend, Boney. And Boney was asked to help with an exorcism because the person said, I know your mom used to be a witch doctor. And so you understand about this weird spiritual stuff that's happening. And so he agreed to do that. When he approached the house, the possessed woman gave him a sinister grin. And then Boney tells the story that she called out in a de demonic voice to him. She says, so we meet again, Muchagetwa, which was his African name. But the thing is, nobody there knew his African name. Nobody knew his African name at all. They just knew him as Boney. But the demon knew him, he said. Somehow, the demon recognized him. And in that moment, he says he was tempted to fear. But then he remembered the battle wasn't against he and the demon, and it wasn't against he and the woman. The battle was against the one who is inside him, Jesus, and the one who is inside her. When we face trials like we are right now, as a nation, as a state here in Missouri, or as a church, and there's uncertainty and there's fear, and, and maybe we're wondering, is evil finally getting the last laugh? Or if you just wonder, maybe the devil's out to get us. Remember, the battle doesn't depend on you. The battle depends on the one who's in you. Acts chapter 19 is the story of the birth of a church, the church of the Ephesians. Maybe you remember the book in the Bible that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. That's a letter that he wrote to that church that he helped give birth to. Um, part of us maybe can think that there's always been a church there, but Paul planted that church. And it all started with Paul going into the community and baptizing people and arguing with people in the synagogues until finally they threw him out of the synagogues. They just didn't want to hear about Jesus anymore. And so Paul ends up getting invited into a public lecture hall and starts to lecture there for five hours a day, every day for two years. Can you imagine a world where the religious people don't want to hear about Jesus, but the academies, the universities, they do want to hear about Jesus. And that's where our story picks up in Acts chapter 19. I want to begin with verse 11. Verse 11 says that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Notice here that the healing is both physical and and spiritual, illnesses and evil spirits. When we talk about the brokenness of this world, both of those are always present. Both of those are present, the physical and the spiritual. The devil can afflict you both physically and spiritually. Word of warning, it's easy in a passage like this to put too much emphasis on the magic hankies. Like if you could just get a magic hanky, everything would be okay. Imagine a magic hanky that could go around and it could just heal everybody of this virus. I think if you went around with a magic hanky right now and you tried to heal people of the virus, they'd probably spray you down with a little hand sanitizer or something. So, so that's just really not going to work. So don't put the focus on the hanky. I think that's what the, the scriptures are trying to tell us. But how does the sentence start? It says that God did extraordinary miracles. God did it. Not Paul. God did it through Paul and through all of this. The battle wasn't against Paul and the demon forces. It was against the one who was in Paul. Let's go to verse 13. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, were doing this. Isn't that a great name? The seven sons of Sceva. I just love to say that name. Say that name in your home right now. The seven sons of Sceva. See, these are Jewish exorcists. 
And they saw that Paul was having great effect, that he had great power, and he was saying the name of Jesus. And so they wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to have the same power. And so they were using the name of Jesus as an invocation. They were using the name of Jesus like a magic trick or a magic spell. They were using it for their own advantage, maybe for their own glory. And apparently, the spiritual activity at the time was such a problem that even the Jewish high priest, the Jewish chief priest in that area, was commissioning his sons to go out and do this kind of work. Verse 15. One day, the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Those of you who try to drive out demons in your spare time, just a warning, (laughs) just a warning. Like, you can't make this stuff up. Like, they're, they're running out of the house naked and bleeding. Come on, the man beat all seven of these guys at once, and he sends them out, which isn't great for their exorcism career. This isn't good validation out there in the community. Do you think when Luke was writing this, some of the other believers came up and they said, hey, Luke, maybe tone it down a bit. Like, Maybe make the, ba- the Bible a little bit more PG or something, this book that you're writing. Like, may- maybe tone it down a little bit. That, it's getting a bit weird. And Paul's like, I don't think so, guys. Like, this is what happened. Don't tone this down. The demon, in fact, the demon knows Jesus. The demon knows me too. The demon's talking about me. The last thing I want is this th- for this thing to be toned down, for this thing to be watered down. And it's so easy for us sometimes to water down the supernatural parts of things, the scary parts of things. But I think Paul's like, Luke, absolutely not. Tell it exactly as it happened. Make sure the world knows that these are the forces, these are the real battles that we're up against. Perhaps one takeaway today. Let's not play around with Christianity. Let's not play around Don't play around with spiritual powers. A lot of us want to know what God's purpose for our life is. And I think that's a great question. But an equally important question. What is the devil's purpose for your life? Like if the devil could get into your life and pattern it exactly the way that he wanted it to go, with all the evil that goes with it, How would the devil want to trip you up? What would the devil want you to be doing? It's important to know God's purpose for your life. It's also important to know what the devil's purpose for your life is. That's a good question. Next verse, verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. See, they're taking it seriously. Once they understand the power that's behind all this, they're taking it seriously. They're confessing their sins. They want to be done with that old life. And they want this new life that Paul is preaching about. This is how the Ephesian church was born. This is how the Ephesian church was born. It started as fear because they realized the power of the supernatural, but it didn't just stay as fear. It led to the lifting up of the name Jesus. It led to worship. It led to humbling themselves before Jesus. Verse 19. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Imagine you're driving down I-70. And if you're somewhere else, just pick the interstate that's near you. But if you live here in the St. Louis, St. Charles area, imagine you're driving down I-70 and there's a huge bundle of Ouija boards on fire. There's a bonfire 
of Ouija boards. And you can't believe what's happening. And there's people that are dancing around this bonfire of Ouija boards. And you stop because you want to know what's going on. And you ask them, what are you doing? And imagine if they said to you, we're starting a church, man. We're starting a church. Because that's, that's how the Ephesian church started. And by the way, if you do the math, the dollars of everything they burned, the 50,000 drachmas, that would be something like $20 million today. They burned in one day $20 million of books on magic and astrology and witchcraft. This is huge spiritual cleanup by the Holy Spirit. This, this is a 180 turn to following Jesus and to giving up these magic spells and wanting to follow the living Christ. Later on, Paul writes to the Ephesians and he says to them, be careful how you live. Make sure the devil doesn't get a foothold. Make sure the devil doesn't get a foothold in your life. Paul has shared about a God of love who gave his life for us. This is the name that drives out evil. A God who doesn't run from your pain, but ultimately takes the pain upon himself on the cross. And he dies to sin to destroy sin. He dies to evil to destroy evil. And then he rises to life. And then he gives life. This is what Jesus did for you. So Paul's saying, don't give the devil even a foothold in your life. In a month from now, or maybe a year from now, I know 10 years from now, you're going to look back on this time, and you're going to remember the coronavirus. We're not going to forget this. And you're going to look back on this time, and we're going to ask this question. How do we want to be remembered? How do you want to be remembered for how you handled yourself, how we handled ourselves, how we reacted? I mean, do we let the devil get a foothold in me, in my church, in my community, in my country, my family? Or was the name of Jesus lifted up like it was in Ephesus? It's an important question to answer. Now, some of you might be at home thinking, look, I still don't know about all this God and devil stuff. Like, I haven't made my mind up about that kind of stuff. I just don't know about all that. And so for you, I want to close with a story. There was a man, and he was taking a walk through the forest. He looked up and said, what majestic trees. What beautiful leaves on them. What powerful rivers. This is a place with amazing animals. And he said to himself, this is beautiful. And as he continued along the river, he heard a rustling in the bushes. And turning to look, he saw a seven-foot grizzly bear that had started to charge him. And he ran as fast as he could up the path, but it was no use. And the bear was closing in on him. And then in an instant, maybe for the first time in his life, he shouted, oh my God. And time froze. There's no more sounds in the forest. He couldn't hear the trees and he couldn't hear the river. He couldn't hear anything. And then a bright light shone from heaven right down on him. And a voice from heaven said, you have denied my existence all these years. And you want me to help you out of this predicament. And the man looked into the skies and he said, I know it would be hypocritical of me to suddenly ask you to treat me as a Christian. But perhaps you could make the bearer a Christian. Very well, said the voice. And the light went out and the sounds of the forest resumed. But the bearer lowered his paw. And he bowed his head and spoke, Lord, bless this food 
which I am about to receive. Friends, at times like this, lots of us look to God for help, and we should, and we want you to. We want you here. No matter how long this lasts, we're going to be here for you. We're going to be sharing God's word for you because we think it's good news, and it tells you all the beautiful things that God wants to tell you. Messiah will be here for you. And God has always been in this building. God has always been in this building. But now we want to make sure that the love of God shows up in our homes even more. This can be a time of revival for the church. It can. It will be. A time for us to love the world like never before. To give to the world like we never have. And maybe our best gift And this is the gift that the disciples of Jesus had after his resurrection. And this is the gift that Paul had and that he gave to the Ephesians. And the Ephesians, after their scroll-burning party, man, they had this gift. They lost their fear of death. And when you lose your fear of death, when God gives you the gift to lose your fear of death, because you know who holds your life and your eternal life in his hands. There is nothing this world can do to you. Nothing. When God takes away your fear of death. You want that? We want it for you. Join us next week. We're going to finish this series on Stranger Things. And we're going to talk about God's answer to this fear. God's answer to the fear of death And we're going to celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Let's pray. Lord God, as the world continues to grapple with the vast effects of pandemic, we're all learning to care for each other and to gather together in new ways. And we're presented with challenges and obstacles we could have never imagined. And we're now forced into new realities, relational, financial, emotional, spiritual. As followers of Jesus, help us hold this time with life, grace, and perhaps more importantly, peace. Draw us closer to you as we pray for healing for others. Every home here has individual people on their hearts and minds who need you. So hear our prayers together and teach us to pray Jesus' prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In all our steps of precaution, of preparedness, may we fix our eyes on Jesus, who knelt and touched the lepers, who joined our messy humanity with all our illness, all our disease, even our death. Who calls us, especially in times like these, to spread his kind of incarnational love. And remember, Messiah, this is not the church. My brothers and sisters, you are the church. And may God's peace be with you. Amen.